responses. And I'm also going to try and bring in one or two of the questions from the floor um, to try and do both of my responsibilities. Um, perhaps I might actually ask Tessa Jow, um, in light of what's happened here and in response to a question from Eroni Ripa Demina from the LSE, um, perhaps you could reflect a little bit on the mechanisms that triggered the demand of a strong London government after all that time with, with no mayor. And from those mechanisms, do you think there's some lessons that might be transferable to Mumbai? Well, I think that the, uh, one of the great political battles and sort of defining political battles in London of the 80s was the abolition of the Greater London Council. So, uh, you know, London uh, was, is a city that had had its own government. Its own government was uh, wound up and it became, as I say, became one of the, um, the great cause celeb for progressives to fight the abolition of, um, of London's government. So in a sense, the, um, the existence of London government was in the recent memory of um, you know, the, the progressive center left who, um, and you know, it, was, it was a major commitment um, following our re-election in 90, or our election in 1997 to restore London government. So, I mean, I think that, you know, the kind of democratic argument is probably, um, from London's point of view, the most powerful, but that was also linked to very strong voices from business about the, uh, the benefit of um, the clear leadership of elected government in order to promote business confidence. Um, if I could ask our respondents to keep their remarks relatively um, uh, brief, um, could I actually ask Ashok Bal, who's the Deputy Chairman of the Mumbai Port Trust, to reflect on what we've heard this morning. Thank you very much. In fact, uh, Mr. Korea, in his presentation, referred Mumbai City. Mr. Bal. Mr. Korea, in his presentation, referred Mumbai city as started as a port town. Mr. Cyrus Gazdar, he wants a city without port because he wants the docklands to be relocated and released for cities' alternative use. I would like to offer my observations on these comments. Uh, as you may be aware, the Mumbai city, or sorry, Mumbai port, as an organized entity, came into being in 1873, although this port was in existence since Portuguese times. So the port and the city form an integral part of the city's history and legacy. The port is an inseparable part of city's identity, character, and history. And this inclusive identity needs to be preserved and protected. The historical link of the port from the city cannot be severed. Second, there appears to be a perception in some quarters that the old port of Mumbai is declining or it has no future. This perception is far from the truth. Today, this port is the fastest growing major port in the country. In fact, it has recorded a very strong sustained increase in traffic for the last several years. From 26 million tons in 2002-03, it doubled to 52 million tons in 6-7, and it is set to achieve 60 million tons during the current fiscal. And I'd like to emphasize that this steady increase in traffic is associated with rapid decline of its hinterland. You know, after 96, when the port sector was thrown open to the private sector participation, you know, many ports and terminals came up on the West Coast. As a result, the hinterland of Mumbai port, which was at one time extended up to North India, Central India, and Western India, has rapidly shrunk, and today it is limited to Mumbai city and its adjoining areas. And let me be 
on record to say that the 95% of the cargo that is handled by Mumbai port is either originating from or destined to Mumbai region and its surrounding areas. 76% of the cargo is captive to the Mumbai port. Therefore, this underscores the locational necessity of the port for this region. And any forced displacement of a major economic activity like Mumbai port will be very counterproductive and detrimental to the interest of the port. Having said that, see, now we are talking about the eastern water, you know, there are references about the eastern water development. Yes, Mumbai port occupies a part of the eastern waterfront, and we need to understand the unique character of the eastern waterfront, which is a part of the Mumbai harbor. Enclosed by the mainland on one side and the island on the other side, it provides a very safe, natural, sheltered, and protected harbor, unique of its kind in the world, and which is eminently suitable for development of port and shipping activities. See, we are talking, you know, when you talk about this uh, uh, Bombay port... Mr. Bell, could I perhaps I'll take a minute. To I'll take a minute. Your... When you talk about the Bombay port, we talk about its landed estates. Yes, it's a landed estates, which are not meant for the port's operational areas, are need to be redeveloped, and there is no true opinion about that. But then it has to keep in mind the recent judgment of the Supreme Court, which protects the tenants, and it need, needs to take into account the interest of the tenants. And uh, as far as the land industry is concerned, we have a business plan in place which provides for putting land for public use, mainly as Mr. Korea was referring to, the passenger water transport between Mumbai city and the different locations across the harbor, we plan to have a cruise terminal. We want to develop marina. We have provided a project for social time, housing. Please. Thank you.